What's up guys, it's November the 9th and Microsoft Activision Blizzard King has just released the latest update to the Warcraft 3 patch on the PTR that is slated to go live in Warcraft 3 uh, Battle.net, you know, live version, Reforged, Classic. By the way, a lot of people ask me, uh, are you playing Reforged or Classic? Because the graphics look old. What about the new and improved ones? And well, most of us, we don't think the new one is improved. It does exist but it's all within a single client of Warcraft 3, which is Reforged. If you still have like the CD of the old Frozen Throne Warcraft that you bought back in 2003, when you try to go online with that, uh, it actually shatters that client and asks you to get the new normal Reforged, which is 30 gigabytes via the BNet launcher. But in it, there's the option not to use the new graphics, which is what I and everyone else with eyes actually does. Uh, so yeah, I, I am playing Reforged, but it looks like classic and that's just the way I and everyone wants it. But anyway, that game that hadn't had updates for like a year or more of Radio Silence and which wasn't mentioned at BlizzCon that just happened a week ago at all, is still getting a couple of PTR updates. And I've covered them so far on this channel, you can search back in the last few videos of the past few weeks. And here is uh, the fourth version of the PTR notes, and I'm going to go through it. Basically, they go through a couple of changes that are new today, November 9th, and then they summarize everything to show you all the differences from current live version to the PTR. And if you don't know, the PTR is the patch test region. It's not very populated, not a lot of people these days uh, go to the PTR to stress test all these changes and do some free QA, but it exists and you can go there and the way you access it is to take your bnet launcher and then you press the warcraft symbol right here and then you get to the bottom always get to the bottom of it you uh, hit this uh, globe thing and then you can choose america europe asia right i don't know why i showed that it's irrelevant you click this warcraft thing you go to ptr and you have to install it as a separate install so live is still the same, you know, live that it was a year ago, but soon at the end of November, whatever is on PTR is going to get ported to Warcraft 3. So that's the situation. So let's see what are today's changes. Today's changes starts with something very, very exciting. I was just out for dinner and I saw this one before I got home to discuss it with you guys. In the past, throughout pretty much all of Warcraft 3's competitive history until 2019, Moonwell re mana regeneration rate was 125, which is, I believe, 125 mana per second. And this only happens during nighttime, either the real night or artificial nighttime via the Night Elf, Ancient of Wonders, Moonstone for 50 gold, which induces temporarily art artificial night and makes your Moonwell mana regenerate. 125 was the going rate pre-Wellspring. Wellspring actually increases mana regenerate further and increases the maximum uh, mana pool in Moonwells. And it's good. It's a very good upgrade, but it comes out at tier 3. So uh, Moonwells have always been kind of good throughout all of Warcraft 3's history. Um, in order to get conclusive scientific proof that this is true, I asked my wife in the car today, did you ever feel like Moonwells are weak? She was a Night Elf main, playing at uh, no measurable MMR whatsoever. So do not take that with a grain of salt. Just take our word for it, because she's awesome. She said, no, she didn't think Moonwells are weak. So there you go. She's on my side, and I think that proves it. So anyway, uh, I, Moonwells were buffed in 2019 to suddenly get more mana regen. Nobody knew why, it wasn't explained why, it was done by the campaign editor uh, of, of Classic Warcraft, uh, Matt Morris, uh, alongside 13 other Night Elf buffs, including Keeper buffs, uh, Hunter's buff, Archer buff, Tree of Life buff, Goldmine buff, etc. And not really explained why, because Elf was not weak. Uh, Elf is the top two most prize money winning uh, race. Of course, Moon is guilty of a lot of that, uh, but there's always top players of every race. Uh, Elf and Human were the best. And then in recent years, after several patches, maybe Human dropped off quite a bit, but Elf remained strong, Undead got stronger, and Orc, therefore by comparison, fell, but is also not weak. So anyway, seeing this get reduced, um, I think it's nice. It's still more than it used to be throughout most of Warcraft's competitive history, 
but not as wildly high as it has been the last three years. In the past, you could rush Night Elf, bring Demon almost to death, and not, li not a lot of mana, and then he would heal up full, and then you bring him almost to death again, and you would spend like 300 gold of heal solves on all your units to heal yourself up while he's healing for free. But after that, you suddenly reach this point where their moon wells are more empty, they are more depleted, the hero cannot heal full anymore. And this only happens if they're like very careless with their health and their mana, they're spending very much like there is no tomorrow, and then suddenly you could do this depletion exhaustion strategy. It wasn't easy, but you could fatigue their resources. And every time I tried that in the last few years, it doesn't work anymore. Like the immolation, all your units, the immolation, uh, they just turn it on, they just attack move, not a lot of micro, and then the demon has no more mana and not much health. He goes back, heals full, does it again, goes back, heals full again. It felt wrong. It was also un an unfounded buff, and I feel like it's long overdue. I did talk about this before. I'm very glad that they are trying this out, and I'm curious to see how it will feel going up against it and also playing as it, since I do play uh, you know, all of the races at least sometimes to also see how they feel. I think this is a great change. They were contemplating last patch to reduce mana burn range. I also issued concern that this may make them feel very bad against Undead in particular. Uh, DK Lich Coil Nova would zone the demon so hard, he would have to come so close, he would take so much damage from just, you know, just getting hit trying to go in for a single mana burn that uh, it may feel just bad to use. I think it's correct that it gets reverted. Abomination collision size was reduced in an effort maybe to buff them. But Abominations do not get masked. I did this recently for a YouTube challenge to mask them. Play like the Korean Undeads of 2003, 2003, that's 20 years ago. Awareness check. Uh, but actually, Abom's design, it does not revolve around them getting masked. Because Orb of Corruption favors ranged units and air units, as they can focus fire easier, and uh, while Vampiric Aura supposedly can be used with Skeleton, Ghoul, and Abomination, Vamp Mass A-Bombs is generally not a valid strategy. Doesn't matter how big or small they are, because a large part of the Abomination power is in, not in their raw fighting strength, but the fact that they spread disease, which is a... I believe right now it's two damage per second for one and a half minute. Uh, it's undispellable, and it greatly taxes Priest healing from human. It also greatly hurts Night Elf in the day, where they have no natural regeneration. So if you can get disease on Dryads, Huntresses, whatever, Archers, it's really nice for Undead and very bad for, for Night Elf. You only need one Abomination for that, or one Meat Wagon. You don't need to mass them. Just like the Frostworm, in a way, one unit does the same thing as many do. Frostworm slows you, but two Frostworm do not slow you more. You make a comparison to Windriders. Windrider Poison does stack. If you do one hit from two Wind Riders each, that unit will take double the poison damage as when just one Wind Rider poisons you. So, uh, you know, some units by design are good for massing. Headhunters, they just deal damage, right? So the more headhunters, the better, the more damage you do. Additionally, every headhunter has bonus regeneration with the upgrade. So having more headhunters and cycling damage taken among many headhunters is good because you get more regen you get more total benefit but the abomination has no more total benefit so why am i saying all this is because a collision size reduction is uh, only useful if you wanted to mass them otherwise you probably want them bigger to body block one two a bombs to body block so what was probably meant to be a buff why are we assuming it's a buff they never said it in the patch notes but we're assuming it's a buff because uh, abominations don't get used that much. So by making them smaller, it actually makes them weaker rather than better. If you gave a collision size reduction to torrents, it would actually be a buff because torrents benefit in greater numbers. They are essentially a herd animal, like cows, am I right? Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Because the more pulverized you get, the more enemies will die. And if you get them up close with each other, it's easier to uh, make it 80, yeah. Let's make the Abomination 80 size. It would actually make them a lot better. Huge! So they're making it bigger again. 
And the Rubian Tower used to be, as they say here, one. It attacks once every second, and the slow was, I believe, five seconds. So you could slow five units at the same time by rapidly toggling. This was very powerful and should be addressed. It was addressed. I played with it. I still feel like it's quite good. You still get permaslow if you don't micro. You get permaslow on three units if you do micro instead of five. And that is still weaker. And it's also, of course, a 50% damage reduction, which I will say the damage is a lot less important than the amount of units you can slow with a well microed Nerubian. However, what we see a lot in the philosophy of this, what they say is the final update of the patch, is a middle way. It's, uh, it's like uh, Dutch politics. Kind of the, the middle way every time because of the democracy. And we democratically responded to all of these patches. Many people had opinions on it. Everyone made their videos. And I think they're listening. So they're probably listening to this. Thank you for your continued work on Warcraft. Hope there's more patches after this. Uh, so again, they're going middle way. It's a reduction in speed compared to life, but not as egregious as the tested PTR. I think that's fine. I can live with that. I think that's fair. Re-added audio pass in the campaign. Fixed an issue where assets would unload unintentionally. I have no idea what that means. Updated camera zoom functionality to support more granular zoom values. Uh, oh my God. I actually need to try this out immediately. I glossed over this earlier today. But I didn't actually... Oh, this is so important. This is so nice. I hope you can also lock the camera without... I hope you can disable camera zoom very, very precisely. So let's check it out. I'm on the PTR now. And let me see if I can show it to you guys. Yep, there we go. Options. This one is exciting. This is important. Oh, nice. Yeah, I mean, it should be that way. So... I'm a 1950 user. I don't mean I'm that old. I mean, I like using 1950. Default is here. Max is here. Enable improved zoom. Okay. My hope now is that mouse wheel is disabled. It stands to reason that default and max being the same value means that I cannot zoom in or out, which is what I would want. Okay. I can still zoom in. Maybe that's because they need to allow for you to check the uh, the close view. Uh, so why do I care about this? If I was a perfect human being with perfect equipment, I would not care about this. But I am not perfect. I like to limit the things that can go wrong from misclicks. Uh, these days, a lot of mice get made with low durability. It's not like the old days, is it, guys? Remember? In our days, products were built to last. Remember? But it's not like that anymore. So a lot of mice these days get made with a very shoddy mouse wheel. In Warcraft 3, Dota 2, Starcraft 2, etc., you can drag mouse wheel like this. But many mouse wheel cursors on modern mice are of low quality. They need to hit a balance between being able to click it to drag as I'm clicking it now. Maybe you can hear it. And they also need a balance between allowing you to zoom in windows or in games with fluidity and flexibility without skipping more tiers than you would like that you can do single scrolls as I am doing now. And there needs to be a shoddy make. There needs to be like a stable make for the button so that it feels good to press the button without rolling to the next tier by accident while pressing. And I'm finding that most mice do not actually fulfill these requirements. Therefore, I like it in a game when you can say, disable camera zoom. Dota 2 has this, Warcraft 3 does not. So every time, and I learned to use mouse drag wheel in Dota because it's needed. In Warcraft 3, I used to edge pan like so. But I learned how to do dra uh, dragging with the mouse cursor, the middle mouse button, the scroll wheel essentially, in Dota. It's important so that you keep your cursor in the middle of the screen while playing next to your hero. Whereas in RTS, I make more sweeping movements, I do edge panning. And because of this, I do accidental zoom-ins. So I wish it could be different. But that's the final gripe that I have with the current camera options. Can't you change zoom button? 
Yeah, but I'm, I want to have my pie and eat it. I want to be in Windows where I do not use the button. I want to just be able to scroll. So if I completely disable my mouse engine scroll wheel, then I can no longer scroll on Reddit. I'm a pie enjoyer. I still want to use Windows normally without sacrificing everything for the Warcraft. In-game hotkeys. No, that's what I'm saying. There is no hotkey for mouse wheel zoom. Uh, that does not exist in Warcraft 3. And I'm asking for that to exist. It would be pretty easy for them to just say disable zoom. But besides that, I'm really happy that you can now granular choose your zoom in level. I love it. You still cannot granular choose it while in game, which is a minus. It would be nice if I could do, you know, an edit here. 1951, 1951, and then back. Did it work? Well, let's choose something a little bigger. Maybe it does work, actually. It looks grayed out. But what if I say 2100, 2100? Will I zoom out? I did not. So it will remember it next time I start a game. So if I restart, now I'm 2100. Okay. So you have to restart the entire game. Ideal would be you can do this while in game. And I know that it is possible because custom maps allow this. But that's not yet possible here. As you can see, I am 2100. And when I restart, now I am 1950. Maybe not everyone recognizes it, but it's pretty obvious to me. So those are the only two things that I think could be better. But the most important thing of all is fixed before you could only switch from like 2100 straight to, I don't know, 1850 or 1800, which was way too big of a step and was actually not hitting my sweet spot. So now hitting my sweet spot and it will hit everyone's sweet spot, sweet spot because everyone can choose as they like. Big W for Microsoft Blizzard Activision King. Thank you. Next. Added the save load functionality to online games. Does not apply to ranked. Updated camera zoom functionality. Enabled the ability to view Heroes XP bar by hovering the mouse over the bar in the selection panel in observer mode. Added the ability to view profile for your teammates and opponents in the tournament results screen. Nice. Due to instabilities in the campaign as a result of numerous AI and scripting changes, we are rolling back changes that were previously made in version 133. The previous audio pass was not rolled back. Additionally, there is a small warning from a map maker. He asked me to share this the next time I was doing a patch note review. Namely the following. Blizzard has deleted the 133 campaign update. This is important. The, the 133 update fixed numerous broken AI files, Ooh. gameplay bugs, and you even can. added difficulties as not every mission had all three. This contains the bulk of the campaign audio pass, at least five months of work for both gameplay and cutscenes, including special effects for in-game moments and new music. The new story mode was designed for new players, and more importantly for players with mobility issues, they can only use one hand. This is commonly referred to as accessibility updates. The campaign will be in a broken state from a gameplay perspective if, as said, the 133 campaign update is reverted. The reasons listed are not accurate. It was HD weather effects that caused the crashes. I tested this locally and I was able to fix it perfectly. There are no issues with AI files. So what is listed here? The instabilities in the campaign as a result of AI and scripting changes. That's why we're rolling it back. So this map maker alleges that there is no problem with the AI, that it's actually a weather effect problem. Well, if this scratches familiarity to whoever is reviewing this video, uh, if you work at Blizzard and you work at this, feel free to message me on Discord and I'll put you in contact with the person that said that they were able to fix this perfectly without changing anything in AI, but it was actually HD weather effects. So something is being lost that doesn't need to be lost for the wrong reason. Fix the crash that would primarily happen on the fall of Silver Moon, where a visual effect would try playing on a different game thread. And a bunch more things that 
I implore you to pause the YouTube video for if you want to read it, but that I don't have all that much op opinion on personally. So we will move on to the balance changes. Can't they just employ this map maker? He used to be. He used to be. Okay, but now he will work for free. Uh, as we essentially uh, all are a little bit. <laughs> okay, militia duration increased from 40 to 42 and a half. So, used to be 45 way back when, for most of Warcraft history, was nerfed to 40 maybe in 2018, 19, 2020. Human are being given back a little bit of power, 42 and a half, I'm okay with this. Bash bonus damage, always 25, now going up 25, 40, 55. No stun change, just more damage, it's fine. Devotion aura increased by a bit, 2, still 2, 3 and a half, now 4, 5, now 6, fine. Keep increasing food from 12 to 14, it's fine. Castle, priest will cast faster, but heal is slower. It matches the same healing per second. But they can now therefore cast Dispel more easily after finishing a heal. This is a nice quality of life improvement that humans will enjoy. Archmage gets more strength. That means they get they get uh, comboed less easily by or War Stomp, Chain Lightning, Focus Fire, Blade Master, Hex, Shadow, Focus Fire, Death Knight, Colonova, Nova, Focus Fire. Archmage is a big target. He, he gets bullied a lot. Humans pretty much learn to get bullied from the start of the game because they have such powerful growth strategies if they don't get harassed that they must be bullied. So this is just the way that Warcraft is balanced and uh, Archmage is definitely a big must for humans oftentimes. He's not weak, but humans will enjoy this little health gain. It's not too crazy. What this means is basically you have two strength more by level 10. Right? It, and it also means that at certain levels you will have one strength more than you otherwise would because while decimals are remembered they are not expressed in gameplay terms so there are certain levels now i cannot tell you which that he will gain a bit of extra hp in particular i think one strength is 25 health so there's going to be some levels where archmage has 25 health more than he otherwise would and there's going to be some levels where he has 50 health more than he otherwise would. Not a huge change, but a nice little resistance to burst. Moonwell, uh, Paladin move speed a little faster. I think this is good. Overall, I think all of these are really good and acceptable. And after some of the more wild changes, I feel like this is a lovely middle way that gives humans some nice buffs. And I think makes human very competitive right now. They already had one really good tournament recently where three humans took top four in a tournament. Uh, but that was more of an isolated tournament and overall they had been less successful uh, as of late so this could be pretty exciting for them level 2 archmage in particular has 25 bonus health says neo and uh, yeah that's one of those tipping points i talked about with a specific granular example then moonwell mana regeneration reduction um still better than it used to be worse than it is now i think it's a lovely middle way and i think it's very needed i think much of night elf's strength comes from that but it's not just that it's that having really much moonwell regeneration is a skill uh it's a mistake softener if night elves stopped wasting as much health and mana on stupid mana burns and needless immolations but then always getting paid off with full mana and health again from their lucius moonwells if orcs did the same with heal solves like imagine you walk towards an opponent and you heal solve yourself and it gets insta cancelled that's the kind of energy that a lot of night elves treat the preciousness of their moonwell juice with not the best night elves best night elves know how to manage their resources properly but it's such a mistake equalizer that it makes so many mistakes not even matter which really very many other races don't have the same energy of so i think this is a skill expression increaser and it's also a needed nerf. Immolation activation cost. I liked the experimentation with cheaper activation costs for immolation. I don't remember what it used to be anymore. Was it 25 to turn it on? I think it was 25, which made it feel extremely all in. There were very few night elves after 2004 
that ever used emulation seriously. I can almost remember every instance where emulation was used seriously. I think there was one game of Creel Office against Sky, and then there was W.E. Suho from China, uh, Creel Office from Norway, of course, and Suho sometimes used Emulation Rush with Staff of Teleport on a Wisp against Human. He sometimes used that, and it's very all in, it's very risky. But almost always, they greatly regret it. One, because Moonwell regen was 125, and it's very expensive to outheal Immo. And two, because once you turn it on, because it costs 25, you're incentivized to leave it on for at least 10 seconds, even if the situation changes and you're no longer in range of anyone. Because if you toggle it off and on, well, you've lost three seconds of, you know, free running ammo. Uh, so this is, um, this was good that they reduced it from 25 to less. But one is a little crazy because that completely removes the gameplay decision of turning it on and off. And I think 10 is a nice middle way. I think 15 would be acceptable. I feel like 7 would be acceptable. Anything in between 10, I think it's lovely. And I think it is a good balance between, you know meaningful decision a meaningful resource but not prohibitively much that it feels so all in that if you turn it on you pretty much have to stay and burn up until you go supernova emulation mana buffer requirement increased that doesn't mean much to me i think it just means they need to have at least 10 to turn it on i'm not exactly sure or maybe it means how much it costs per second to keep it on it's not 10 mana per second though is it i'm not sure what it means uh, Warden Blink cooldown does get buffed quite a lot. Some people were worried about this, but I again remind people it used to be one second and Warden was more popular and this was for more than a decade. But Warden is fun to watch. It's fun to play with and it's not unstoppable. There are counters against it. It is uh, something a little different than, you know, Demon or, or Keeper every game. I think Night Elf having a lot of starting heroes was often part of their uh, identity partially enabled by Moonwells, and I think it's nice to have Warden in games. She's cool. Keep in mind also that Blink level 3 pretty much only happens when Warden gets 7, which is admittedly more common than you would think, because Warden's kit actually is uniquely suited to be solo hero used, as she is a spellcaster that scales her damage and mobility with every level. Every single level for her matters, in a way that it's really not quite the same as for a Death Knight or a Farseer that has more underwhelming secondary spells or abilities. So she does get solo heroed a lot. She can solo creep very fast. She can kill peasants to get to level 6 even faster. So 7 is not uncommon. But some strength at level 7 is okay, I think. And 2.5 seconds still allows for counterplay way more than 1 second ever did. If Warden blinks in and fans you can stormbolt her you can hex her even if you're 60 years old whereas with one second eh, you know blink in you start to aim the stormbolt hold on there son let me stormbolt you you rapscallion you harlot you're not getting away from me this time warden and you swing back your pimp hammer and let it fly loose and boom blink disjoint stormbolt misses so uh yeah, I think one second is crazy, and uh, two and a half second is okay. It's strong, but it's fun for Elf. They get new play toy, because it can't all be nerfs. That would make Night Elves disincentivized, unmotivated to keep playing. Fan of Knives likewise gets some damage buff. Hard to parse exactly how much. I tried it out once, felt pretty strong, but it was not weak before either. I found it hard to really uh, find out. Mana Flare, max damage. I think it's a valid nerf. A unit that doesn't get used that much, but is so strong against its direct uh, purpose. This pretty much, I think, doesn't even affect Obsidian Statues. Mana Flare is a multiplication of damage based on the source mana cast of um, the spell that is being cast. Statues pulsing, pulsating with mana and healing buffs doesn't actually reach high enough of a max to cap this out. This mostly affects, and I actually need to check what is the exact percentage multiplier. I believe maybe it's like um, times 10 or maybe it's times 5. I'm going to check Wikipedia, Mana Flare, Fairy Dragon. It is... No, I know it affects statues. It doesn't cap out the damage. So damage per mana 4. Okay, there we go. So Obsidian Statues. 
obsidian statues. Their maximum mana cost, I think, is six or so. Essence of Blight cast ten. Oh yeah. Ten, Spirit Touch ten. You need ten mana to cast, but it costs two mana per target, up to a max of ten. So there you go. So Mana Flare actually does only 40 damage to statues, and it cannot do more than 40. So the damage cap of 100 is only relevant for spells that cost 25. That means that Inner Fire, I think it's 25 right now, Inner Fire already caps damage. Bloodlust costs like 30 or 40, it already caps on 100 damage. Now those are only going to deal 80 damage. Spirit Link costs 75, so that would, in theory, deal 300 damage. But luckily it's capped at 100. But now it's capped at 80. And that makes them weaker. You can also not Mana Flare twice on the same unit, in case you were wondering. If one Spirit Walker casts Link, and there's two ma mana, there's two Fairy Dragons, one of them will take priority. Uh, they will not both shoot at the same target. But keep in mind, Mana Flare is Splash. So if the Walkers are next to each other, two Walkers both cast Spirit Link, two Fairy Dragons, will both cast mana flare they both take double damage because it splashes i think it's 100 i think it's 100 percent of the damage maybe there's outer and inner damage circles mana flare um also increases no not mana flare yeah mana flare increases the fairy dragon's armor area of effect 750 damage 150 on heroes Splash radius 200. So the AoE, the searching range is 750, and the splash damage radius is 200. And it doesn't say that there is a drop off if it is without some area. So, yeah, if you get splashed at all, you take identical damage. So it's 100 on everyone, now it's going to be 80 on everyone. And I think that's a fair uh, nerf, and I love it. Mark of the Talon can now be made via tier 2 so you can be a tier 2 talent and cast fairy fire from the sky i think that's so much fun and one of the coolest play toys that they have hey man thank you for the rave rate thank you for the rave glade thank you for the rave g glade that is how i'm going to say that have a good rave thanks fan <laughs> what's up <laughs> wiggling uh yeah okay cool uh, i think this is a, a fun play thing and this is a fun play thing and i think these are all deserved nerfs cool undead spiked catapace melee damage will indeed be buffed to a max of 45. i tried this out it almost always feels like a meme because it really just seems better to go beetles and impale because of that despite my memes claiming that oh my god it's so strong stop hitting yourself stop hitting yourself i don't think this is going to be broken even if it does look like a large damage return thorns already offers 45 melee damage return on everything and it's also not quite broken it's very strong against orc when playing bear strats but it's not quite broken uh, most likely and so me melee damage return aura really is one of the weakest in the game and therefore I'm not worried about this. He's also going to get a buttload of armor, which uh, I think is a fun play thing. Crypt Lord will be a massive tank. This could be really strong. But ultimately, the biggest weakness for Crypt Lord is that he doesn't have Unholy and Coil. Basically, he's not Death Knight. What's wrong with me? I'm a nice guy. I've got a lot of armor. I've got damage return. That's not it. You're not Death Knight. I need someone with Coil Nova in my life, and I need someone with Unholy Aura in my life. You're a nice guy, but I... That's all I see you as. Just a big, fat tank. And it hurts to touch you that way. Cripple costs reduced from 125 to 100 mana, I think is a nice buff. Um, which, uh, you know, this spell doesn't get used much. Skeletal Mastery cast reduced. Again, doesn't get used much. Nice buff. Let's see more Necromancers, am I right? Even though it's no Necromancer in November right now. But this patch is slated to hit at the end of November. Uh, so in December, I think everyone can let loose and raise the dead. Nerubian Tower cooldown increased, as mentioned before. Nerubian Tower Frost Attack reduced from 5 to only 3 seconds on heroes. Still 5 on units. I think that's nice. Yeah, I know. I already busted on those Necros. I summoned the dead this month. 
Abomination. Oh, here's an alternative buff to Abominations. Yeah, I had a nice dinner. Thanks. Uh, Abomination turn rate. I had uh, lamb chops with fries. And the wifey had uh, Pokeball with shrimps. Abomination turn rate increased. All right. Increased. Increased. Not decreased. Oh, they're nerfs. I thought these were buffs. It will take them half a second to turn around. Abominations. What? No? They're buffs? Okay, hold on. Doesn't turn rate describe the amount of seconds required to make a full 360 spin? Oh. The higher the number, the faster you turn. Really? Turn rate. The rate at which you turn. Yeah, so what does 0 0.5 mean? I believe you if you guys are saying this. I just wonder what the expression term is. Let me see. Turn rate for Fairy Dragon is 0 0.4. Probably you turn half a rotation in a second. Ah, yeah, it could be like that. Yeah, one second could be the default term. Shouldn't it be called turn speed, not turn rate? I guess it can be kind of. Um, so abominations and fiends will be will turn more agile. Okay. So uh, let's see. Let let let's sum up undead. Could be irrelevant. Irrelevant, most likely irrelevant. Nice nerf, nice nerf. Somewhat noticeable buffs to Abom and Fiend. For Abom, it's almost irrelevant because it don't get used much. Crypt Fiend is staple, so this will be a nice buff for them for uh, stutter stepping. And Dreadlord faster. So overall, I don't feel like Undead changes a lot. I think this is the biggest change. So overall, if I had to express, I would still say, despite all the buffs, on the whole, and that this is how relevance matters, on the whole, for pros, I feel like Undead is nerfed because of this. But this is the secondary important change, and this might just be a buff. Uh, I mean, this is a buff, a big buff, actually. This might actually be the biggest change that Undead has. Maybe this is number one, number two, and then everything else is number three. Um, overall, I think Undead might be just as strong as before. The Rubian is still good. So there's neither something to worry about, nor are pros likely going to try a lot of new things all the seven pros of undead in the game but for nublets these are fun this barely matters for nublets because nublets don't change nerubian targeting much they will probably not notice this but it will still benefit from it and this is fine no change for statues or coil nova this seems to be a much requested change by many people I have not expressed myself about it all too much. I don't know where Undead will be if they can't coil Nova everybody. Statues were already nerfed recently in their mana generation rate. Why don't they ever change statue mana regen? A valid question if they really hadn't, but they have. Mana statues have been nerfed, no? I'm pretty sure that they have been nerfed. You can feel it when you play with it too. I'm going to check the Liquipedia. Here, look. Uh, look guys, to the thing that I have, have not shown you yet. Patch 135, 19 January, Obsidian Statues, Spirit Touch, Mana Restore, reduced from three to two. And Obsidian Statue gives more XP. Uh, 60 XP instead of uh, 40. Statues have been nerfed, 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 nerfed. Spirit Torch now restores three instead of four. Oh my god, it was four when when TFT came out. <laughs> oh, man, 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 man. Anyway, uh, this is... Uh, this was already done. 
less than a year ago. So I think Undead is actually fine now. Next. Orc. Bladestorm. They're gonna do the thing. They're gonna do the thing. It was five at last? Crazy. They're gonna do the thing. Uh, an increase in damage of something like, what is this, 27%? Pretty exciting. Bladestorm. I don't think it's one of the best ults. You often don't take it because you ain't got mana. I think the alternative buff was a mana cast reduction, but damage increase is pretty exciting. Um, seems like a nice buff. Spirit Walker build time reduction by three seconds. This will help against talents, which is still a very strong strategy. We don't use a lot of walkers against human right now, but might do a bit more now. It also kind of enables the backdoor strategy of War, uh, uh, Walker Tauren, which is still very unexplored despite Warcraft 3's very um, well-seasoned state in the gaming scene. Uh, Walker Tauren is something most people don't burn their fingers on, and I, I have done it quite a bit. But even when I was winning uh, games with it some years ago, I pretty much retired from competitive. Re-retired, because I played a couple of tourneys uh, last few years, right? And most people have not copied me, maybe for a good reason, or maybe because they have no experience with it and didn't wish to. Uh, most people play Expo style or like Grand Raider Walker, H HH Kodo, uh, Wyvern. Not really the tier 3 style with Headhunters. Part of the reason I stopped it myself in my fun try-hard ladder games and whatnot is because the Troll Headhunters were nerfed again, which was a very important transition unit going from like 4 to 6 HH into Walker Torrent. You can't just rush Walker Torrent. You needed the 4 to 6 HH. And then they nerfed the speed scroll cast from 50 gold to 70, which was a very important item to keep your headhunters alive. And they nerfed the headhunter health back down to 350, which is what it used to be during most of Warcraft 3's competitive history. And during most of Warcraft 3's competitive history, the last two decades, headhunters were only kind of a joke filler unit. You added one or two if food allowed. Never really massed them in solo because they were just too weak. 375 and the bonus range and the buff to troll regen were all necessary to make them not just viable, but very good even. But it still took a maths professor from Moldavia to actually get the entire scene to start playing them using me as his tool and that made everyone play Headhunters when I finally played it. And uh, Save Orcas uh, begged me to play it over and over. And uh, then when the Headhunters were nerfed down to 350, nonetheless keeping their 100 range and their bonus benefit from Troll Regeneration, we see a lot less of them again. That 25 health matters a lot. And I'm so excited that they're bringing it back in. It makes the 825 HP Grunts and the 375 HP Headhunters both potential viable starting openers as i feel like it should be since ghouls and fiends both are though we don't see as much fiend openers these days i think rifle paladin is, has gotten a bit of a buff because of the paladin move speed militia duration the bash which is a potential follow-up to paladin paladin mk or paladin blood Mage mk devotion buff the food increase for the keep priest buff um, so I like it when every race can open with two different tier 1 units, and this definitely brings them back in. Walker Adept Training and Master Training both get a 10 second buff, which I think is nice. Master Walkers and Master Torrents are not without their counters. You can either blow up the corpses with Siege so that they cannot revive, or you can use any form of air which beats both Walkers and Torrents. You can also use Possession. And you can also just beat them. Like with bears, dryads, and mountain giants. They can actually also just win against torrents and walkers. But it's based also on skill and timings, as it should be. So while walker torrent are strong, they are pretty much not at risk of becoming a rampant, dominating strat. Which is why I think the buffs are not an issue. And exciting. Likewise, torrent gets a 5 second buff. And I think this is the best buff you could give them. Some people have suggested magic resistance slow resistance speed increase i think all of them are really risky because the tauren is potentially very powerful and making their efficiency per population better could make them have a really really strong impact the main issue with torrents is they get countered too easily so getting them out a little bit faster a little bit more agile seems to be the perfect buff to them in my mind 
and I'm excited to see how this will feel. Lastly, Orc gets a small lumber buff on all of their upgrades, both armor, tier one. No, all, all, not just tier one. This is the increment. So it's 25 cheaper at tier one, 25 or 50 cheaper at tier two, and 25 or 75 cheaper at tier three, if I remember correctly. I think it's 25, 50, 75 cheaper per level, uh, which is nice. Uh, tier three armor upgrade costs like 450 lumber normally. Uh, tier one is actually the same. It's the tier two and tier three that are cheaper. Oh, really? Really? What? I have to check it out now. I'm gonna test it. This I need to check myself. I cannot just take the word of a handsome young man in chat. This has to be tested. We must test. Yes, Neo is correct. Now I'm thinking it's very likely to be true. Synergy. So I'm expecting lumber for armor to be 150 wait what no it's always like this isn't it melee weapons hold on a second ranged weapons okay the one i'm very sure of is that ranged weapons was always 100 100 and after upgrading it became 150 200 so should i now expect 150 175 at tier 2 Oh yeah, 25 cheaper. And then the final one was Arcanite uh, Spears, which was 200, 300. So now it's going to be 200, 250. Oh yeah. So it's zero cheaper, 25 cheaper, and then 50 cheaper. So I guess, yeah, armor was always 150, 75. The second one, I actually don't remember. I think it was something, something 225. So now it's going to be something, something 200. Oh yeah, there we go. It was 225, 225. And then the final one was something like 275, 350. Oh, it was 300, 375. So expensive. And now it's going to be 300, 325. Interesting, interesting. And melee attack was maybe 200 slash 100. Oh, was it 150, 175? I guess so. And now 150, 150. And then the final one was 275, now 225? Lumber? Yeah, 225. Okay. Yep. Okay. So basically, if you add everything together, it's 75 lumber per full upgrade tree. Cheaper, so it's a total 225 lumber buff with the most relevant part, the part you actually generally reach, being... Uh, only the tier 2 upgrade, which is a 25 discount on all, aka a 75 lumber buff to being 2 to 2 upgraded. Definitely nothing wild and big, but a nice little buff. Nothing too wild and big. A nice buff. Lumber is quite expensive for Orc, and this will help them to tech a bit more while expanding. They still have a... I get so much proof via the changes that they are reading the patch notes that I put out there into the Aether on YouTube and stuff. And they're reading everyone's patch notes and taking ideas from everywhere. And they've gone for a very balanced middle of the road approach. And I think this patch is really good, much better than the previous iterations. I like pretty much everything, but they still haven't changed this E to an I. Anyway, not a big deal. The number is good. Fire Lord is getting exciting buffs, much cheaper incinerate. Lava split from 15 to 13. Nice. And Volcano a little bit more damage. Tome of Retraining will have two stocks. Fantastic. Teleportation, two stocks. Fantastic. Crystal Ball is now a consumable with two charges. I like this. I explained in a previous video why I think this is a good, good idea. And I still think it is a good idea. Ring of Protection 3 is boring. It's gone. Nice. Claws of Attack is 5 again. Nice. Exciting. And Pity Up to Fatality, 25 gold less. I think that's fair for its value. Because this is an almost always sell item. And this doesn't matter that much. This is fine. They changed the map pool to remove Tidehunters and Autumn Leaves, which is too bad. I kind of like these maps. But they added two other good maps. So I feel like they remove two good ones and they add two good ones, which is fine, I guess. 
but they could also leave them all in but sometimes there's like an ideal number and also um, so long as they do a kind of regular rotation and they keep doing this which is a very good thing blizzard of past of the past 20 years has never really interacted much with the map making scene and we didn't have a vehicle of testing maps in a robust way because we didn't have to make our alternative ladder either there wasn't enough uh, talented programmers to do it or not enough players to want to make use of it but because blizzard dropped the ball so big on not having a working ladder when reforge came out in 2020 talented programmers stepped up people like pad and taxi and so many others that have helped along the way to set up w3 champions they had to come up with their own ladder so now suddenly there's a pipeline for an agile map refreshment system where people are making maps and then we're all testing them because we're playing on that ladder blizzard of old they just did some weird random maps some of them were good some of them were bad and it was just so slow to change they didn't talk or take maps from us or anything that's different now despite all of the shortcomings that sometimes blizzard has shown in some of their decisions in the past few years what has been true in the last year or two or so is that they have been taking maps sometimes the wrong version initially because they don't talk to us enough but more often than not especially recently they've been taking maps from the community and adding them to the ladder pool in warcraft 3 so that when you go to your own regular bnet experience you open this and you're like hey echo isles not the old one this is the new and improved save forecast edited uh, echo isles right we've got this thing right here the extra base which is very important for breaking stalemates then you go to like turn a stand this is a, a somewhat improved version i feel like in some ways it's better than the old ts in some ways it's worse but this map basically came out by matt morris uh in the uh, 2020 reforged patch so nothing too special here but this is like a great sign of improved map making process neo says it's the wrong hammerfall map version as well at the moment yeah they probably just get it from hive workshop or something some old version so <laughs> yeah just talk to us we can make things better we don't even need credit just message some of us and we'll send it to you and it'll quietly be uploaded and it'll be good instead of it'll be perfect instead of almost hey, perfect man right it'll be almost perfect it'll be perfect instead of almost perfect there we go just talk to us we'll we'll help uh you can take the credit blizzard uh springtime map creator save orcas now that's nice it's nice to get your name credited in the game isn't it save orcas that's something i've never had yet maybe i should try to make a map as well I've never had my name in a game, in any game ever. It's one of my bucket list goals. Will Warcraft give it to me? Will I earn for it in Warcraft? Or will Dota? Aren't you in the campaign credits? What? Am I? For my father, the king. Can I can I hire you to to do a ghost map for me, say Vorkas? Put my name on it, but you make it. <laughs> I'm in the credits? Oh, I don't know that. You have name in Dota when watching replay, yeah, but it doesn't count. I mean, like, actually, like, some you created something, right? Or you credited something. Anyway, uh, Lost Temple, Last Refuge. This is um, this is also a user map, Last Refuge. Turtle Rock is a Blizzard classic. Concealed Hill is made by Flo and Hightech, which is the W3 champions. And Hightech might be... He's a long-time community creator. Northern Isles came from us. Twisted. Who's this? McCandlish MMC? Is this the edit? Because I thought Twisted was a Blizzard original. Anyway, the point is, all of these maps are good. Pretty good, and it's almost perfect. And it's great that they're taking maps from the community as well. Can't judge the 2v2 maps and whatnot too much since I haven't played it too much. But soon, I will be playing it. Because I put out a challenge that if we reach 300,000 subs on my YouTube, follow Grubby that sky and i will be playing on w3 champions 2v2 well for as long as we can for as long as you know our schedules align because our schedules actually do not align and we are currently at 299k subs and i think we'll reach it over this weekend of 10 to 12 november so i think this weekend i'm playing 2v2 with sky 
hit that sub button if you haven't already and i'm gonna play with a two-time wcg winner we sky in 2v2 together between us we've won four wcgs <laughs> let's see how we can do <laughs> in two on two so we're almost there almost there uh, so we will soon be actually discovering these maps king and country rusty creek ffa map changes and after looking at recent tournament activity and experimenting with different time zones we've adjusted the tournament schedule where it rotate time zones each week cool very good patch notes i give it a eight out of ten love it thank you for your work blizzard and thank you for watching viewers like comment and subscribe and all that good stuff and as always sub to the grub see ya bye